how a second term could unleash a darker Trump, highlighting the former president's violent and authoritarian rhetoric on the 2024 campaign trail. The paper notes that as he runs for president again, facing four criminal prosecutions, Mr. Trump may seem more angry, desperate, and dangerous to American-style democracy than in his first term. But the through line that emerges is far more long running. He has glorified political violence and spoken admiringly of autocrats for decades. The Times points to an interview from more than three decades ago where Trump spoke admirably of how China crushed Democratic protesters in Tiananmen Square and also highlights his past praise for. That didn't happen, by the way. Saddam Hussein and Philippine strongman Rodrigo Duarte. Duarte. The paper noticed, notes that in a hypothetical second Trump administration, the forces that somewhat contained his autocratic tendencies in his first term, including some staffers, congressional Republicans, and a par partisan balance on the Supreme Court, would all be weaker. As a result, Mr. Trump's and his advisors' more extreme policy plans and ideas for a second term would have a greater prospect of becoming a reality. Let's bring in right now staff writer for The Atlantic, Ann Applebaum, her new piece, part of The Atlantic special issue outlining the dangers of a potential second term for Donald mm -hmm. Trump. is titled, Trump Will Abandon NATO. And I'll pause it here because... This is where, when I was watching this, uh, Ajamu, Nick, and, and Rome, this is where it, it became bizarre to me. Because, you know, you normally you're watching uh, Morning <laughs> Joe, <laughs> uh, uh, and you're expecting bad stuff for them to say, to use against Donald Trump. And considering the reaction to the what's happening in Israel, sort of the reaction to now polling about Ukraine, I'm not understanding the use of saying Trump would abandon NATO as a way of saying we should make sure to not to put him into office. But can you speak, Ajamu, to have you seen, this seems like I've, I've never experienced this, this level of like uh, insider, like establishment uh, propaganda, the charges, uh, the constant coverage of him. Is it a fear that he's really going to remove themselves from NATO? Is it a fear that it's a different approach of, on these wars? Or what do you? what is your take on uh, of the sort of attacks on, on, on Trump? Well, look, I mean, I saw it in 2016 when Jill and I ran um, in, that, in that election. I mean, they had propped up, they had created a Donald Trump. You keep that in mind, folks, that basically... Donald Trump was the candidate that the Democrats most wanted to run against. In their arrogance, they believed that he would be the easiest candidate to run, run against. They completely misread the mood of the country, the consequences and impact of, of 40 years of neoliberal policies. And they kind of uh, revoked that uh, the electorate was, was, in, was prepared to engage in. Uh, and they created Donald Trump uh, but to their uh, ultimate surprise, Donald Trump ended up pulling the thing out. Their, their, their rhetoric uh, during the campaign, though, was one in which they tried to paint Donald Trump as the as the the opposite uh, of liberal values. It's very similar to the tone of that of that article uh, that somehow they represented uh, enlightened uh, liberal values, the highest expressions of of U.S. values and and civilization uh, and that Donald Trump and by extension his supporters and potential supporters uh, were the 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 aberrations they were the they were the uh, the, the the deplorable and concern about those specific policies because remember now when we talk about this whole Trump um, Joe Biden struggle and we, we 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 when people reduce this to these individuals we we undermine and obscure and mystify if you will the class interests that are really in play donald trump represents the the aspirations of, of the petty uh, bourgeoisie the national and petty bourgeoisie primarily based 
in the U.S. These are nationalists in uh, a more traditional sense, if you, if you will. Okay. Right. The hegemony of the internationalist bourgeoisie, the monopolists that have been making uh, policies, controlling the state uh, for the last 40 years. We also need to remember this. This, when we talk about this, the, the hegemony of the neoliberals, let's remember <laughs> that at what point in history did neoliberalism emerge? And what was the, the instrument that was used to, to advance neoliberalism and neoliberal globalization? The 1980s. What was the instrument? The Republican Party. This was part of the counter-revolutionary process that, that, that emerged in the 1970s. But how did, ne how did, so But when we associate neoliberalism today, what party do we associate that with? The Democrats. So neoliberalism has migrated into the Democrat party. Part of that, that process of migration uh, occurred and was consolidated uh, in 2016, when Donald Trump uh, uh, surprised all of them and won. All of the remaining neoliberals in the Republican Party uh, shifted over to the Democrat Party. Okay, They were already in the Democrat Party also, but there was a political shift that took place. Uh -huh. What are the interests? These are the monopolists. These are the internationalists. They have no loyalty to any particular nation. Their only loyalty is to making profit. And that is one of the talking points that the nationalists use, the Trumpians, if you will, uh, in their oppositional politics. People, re people refer to that as some of the more traditional kind of fascistic appeals. And to a certain extent, it is. But the real fascists, from the point of view of some of us, the driving force of fascism in the United States of America is not coming from the Trump forces who, uh, on the national level at least, are not in power, they don't control the state, but the neoliberal bourgeoisie that controls the national state. They are the, they are the authoritarians. They are the ones imposing a state, uh, if you will, a state line when it comes to all of these issues from Palestine, Ukraine, you name it, okay? <clears throat> and the alignment that they have made, the political alignment, political and ideological alignment they made with the controllers of of information in the u.s big tech the media companies basically they have been able to impose a particular kind of perspective and values that they don't want to see in any way challenged and the only challenger they have out there they see is donald trump and the trumpians okay so now with the the real possibility of having to deal with a donald trump again and let's keep in mind folks they will deal with Donald Trump. They will compromise with Donald Trump. Okay, they did it before. When they were prepared to, they had accepted in early 2020 that there was going to be a second, a second term of Donald Trump. It wasn't until the summer of 2020 that they realized, oh, wait a minute, he's vulnerable. We might be able to be able to get rid of him. You know, there's already propping up a Joe Biden. But you know, right now they want to in, ensure that there's no challenge to their hegemonic politics now that's why we've been exposed to this this fear mongering again but for us for many of us the real threat uh to uh to the to the working class in this country uh, and to global humanity emanates not from the trumpian forces but from these fascist neoliberals that control the national state that's why i have fun <clears throat> i have fun with uh talking to like Trump supporters and conservatives. That's why I love that you call neoliberals because I'm like, bro, you're a liberal. Like you guys are neoliberals. If you're a Trump supporter, you should be 100% okay with everything what Joe Biden's doing. He expanded ICE. He deported more people than Donald Trump, funded Israel more than Donald Trump, funded the police more than Trump, funded the military. Where's the, the difference between you guys? You notice how they got to make up these culture warriors, the culture wars to accommodate for that. Yeah. You have Joe Biden pretending to take, take positions that you know he don't fucking believe in. Like you have Joe Biden, his old boomer ass, 
Catholic conservative, socially conservative over here. He do he giving speeches talking about yeah, we gotta stand for the LGBTQ. He don't know what the fuck he's talking about. <laughs> they tell him to say that. 